taking time out of your busy days and busy schedules to uh, uh, participate in today's uh, workshop seminar. Uh, my name is uh, LeVon Asters. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Youth Development and Agriculture Education and director of the Mentoring at Purdue program, which is MAP. And then uh, we have a MAP team, and the co-director here is Dr. Neil Knobloch. On my left, raise your hand, Dr. Knobloch. We also have Kristen Bodd in the back. Um, uh, she's the program coordinator for the on-campus portion. You also have Brittany Brown, who is the HBCU Outreach Coordinator. And then we also have part of a team, which is an undergraduate student, Armenda Boyer, uh, who is the uh, MAP program assistant. So that makes up our, that comprises our MAP team. Um, so MAP, for those of you who don't know, if this is your first time out, is Mentoring at Purdue. It's a program housed within the College of Agriculture. And the purpose of the program is to enhance mentoring of underrepresented minority students underrepresented minority and female students in the College of Agriculture. However, our programs, seminars, workshops, all of our activities, uh, we like to be inclusive of everyone across campus, especially those within the STEM discipline. So we try to reach as many students, faculty, and staff as possible through all of our efforts. Uh, but today, uh, every year, well, last year we had our first event, our guest invited speaker. Uh, and so this year is our second time having such a speaker. And our speaker today will be Dr. Morcia Hill who's the Converge Program Director at the Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Hill, um, again, is Director of Harvard Medical School's program, Converge, Building Inclusion in Science Through Research. Her work focuses on the recruitment, retention, and career advancement of traditionally underrepresented groups in the STEM fields of study. Dr. Hill earned her doctorate degree in sociology from Boston College with her dissertation examining the factors affecting success of scientists and engineers in the Institute of Higher Education. Um, so today's seminar will be entitled, or title, excuse me, Diversity Inclusion, Creating a Culture of Mentoring. And what Dr. Hill is going to share with us is a highlight of practices to enhance the mentoring culture within graduate programs or PWIs, which tend to have low numbers of underrepresented minorities pursuing STEM graduate degrees. So Dr. Hill will present her seminar, and afterwards we'll have time for Q&A, um, and then we'll conclude. So without further ado, I'll bring Dr. Hill up. Good morning on this non-snowy day in Indiana, of which I'm truly grateful. <laughs> um, although I'm from Massachusetts, I'm really a Jamaican at heart, so I do not respond very well to snowy. I'm more um, accustomed to rainy seasons rather than snow. So what I'm going to share with you um, is some work that we have done in our office and offer some of my insights and perspective on what this may mean for Purdue. So I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity inclusion. And for us, diversity inclusion is a capacity building, system-based approach. So I want to focus on a few words. So this is all about building capacity. Um, we're taking a systems-based approach, which means it's holistic, it's multi-level. And it's built on this desire to transform institutions so that they can capture the social and human capital required to achieve their mission, right? So it's, this, it's really about making the best of us, finding the best of all of us in an inclusive environment. This framework or this approach is um, one through which institutions can simultaneously address diversity and inclusion, build their capacity, and potentially transform their institution and realize their mission. So at the core of our work is this mission attainment or trending towards your mission. Um, with the acknowledgement that you can never fully realize your mission, right? But you're headed in that direction, you're on that trajectory. So just to think about, as we're thinking about mission, what are the context relevant factors, right? So what's gonna be important in terms of your mission and as you move and utilize this diversity inclusion framework, is your valid proposition. So what are the things that Purdue values? What are the things that Harvard values? What are the things that all institutions values? And of course, our values are tempered by internal and external drivers. So it's going to be you know, what the federal government is saying, what's happening in the global environment, what are the internal pressures in our own institution in terms of where we're going. So all of those things will play into our ability to achieve our mission. So I want, to, I want to talk about our Purdue. So this is your Purdue, right? Taken straight from your website. So you tell me that your Purdue is very, in terms of its mission, is interested in discovery, is interested in learning through dissemination and preservation, 
engagement through, um, through exchange. So hopefully you recognize these things about your Purdue. So it prepares its graduates to succeed. It promotes human and intellectual diversity by providing equal access and opportunity to representatives of a rich variety of population and cultures, right? So you're telling me that your Purdue is one that embraces diversity in multiple ways. More about your Purdue, um, you can go back because I'm taking this from your website. Um, it de demonstrates its concern for the intellectual and personal growth of every individual. I want to underscore every. All members, I want to underscore all. And our community celebrates members from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and cultivates mutual respect. This is your Purdue, not my Harvard. And it offers students um, guidance that are sensitive to their needs, ability, their interests, needs, and abilities. Pursues excellence, and above all, is open to change. Right? Um, I'm sure there are days when all of us do not believe that our institutions are open to change, but at least we behave as if though, and we espouse the language of change. And you pledge your use, your resources to improve your university, your community, and the world. So I'll talk later about this common good and this collective effort. So you serve the purpose of, of um, Indiana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? You should recognize this. And what I wanna, what I wanna underscore, so I'm taking some time for us to, to revisit what Purdue says it is, right? You, um, from your strategic plan that goes to maybe two, 2014 or 2016, I can't remember, but it, it talks a lot about diversity and inclusiveness. It talks about human and intellectual diversity. You talk about this um, learning environment that's rich and the culture of diversity, e equality, and inclusion. You talk about this diverse educational climate, right? So when I come to Purdue, your Purdue, as I experience it, should be one where I'm seeing diversity in multiple ways, right? If I'm using your strategic plan as my signpost. Um, and there's more. Inclusive community, um, diverse and global perspectives. So from a diversity inclusion framework, which is the one I'm sharing with you, I, as an outsider, begin to understand Purdue as an institution that values, recognizes, and is capturing the potential benefits of diversity, um, the multiple dimension of, of diversity, diversity, or at best is well positioned to do so. So you have a strategic plan that has a lot of language about diversity and inclusion, and that suggests to me that you're either doing it or you're well positioned to do it, right? So you're, you're in one state or the other. Um, so for us, the working definition that we use for diversity inclusion is it's something about the system where an institution demonstrates in its policies, practices, and programs a recognition of the benefits of diversity and inclusion in building its capacity. So it tells me that this is an institution where you're well positioned to capture the benefits of diversity and you're gonna show that to me when I review your policies, programs, and practices. So everything about your institution tells me that you are serious about diversity and inclusion. And you're serious about this because you understand that there's something about diversity and or inclusion which will help you to attain your mission, whatever that is, right? You're a land-grant institution and you know best what your mission is. So um, my transformed institution, which is what Purdue should look like, is an institution that has captured the financial capital that's inherent in diversity, the social capital, the human capital, and the intellectual capital. Uh, but I want to go back to talk about you know, this notion of increasing, that you're increasing your assets through diversity. Now, I want to give you a few examples. So um, an institution that would have captured the financial benefits that can be derived from diversity inclusion. And I'll use what I know best, right? So I'm at Harvard University, Harvard Medical School. We're a medical institution. So we do a fair amount of clinical trials. 
My example is, if we're doing clinical trials and we need individuals from certain communities, I'm going to use URM, or minority communities. If you have minority faculty, then you stand a better chance of, of meaningfully engaging and negotiating with those communities. So that would be an example of your financial capital, right? You're doing research. In terms of your human capital, you know, there's some evidence that suggests that the more institutions have a diversity of perspectives and individuals, it enriches the learning environment. It also enriches your students' capacity and their ability to navigate and negotiate in a global context. All right, so you're not, um, as the world becomes more global, more dynamic, you want students who are trained at Purdue to be known for their ability to move easily to a different culture, your human capital. And of course, your social capital is what, is, what, um, what faculty get. So my social capital is going to be who I'm connected to. Right? So you don't necessarily want all of your students and your faculty and your administrators to connect to people who are like-minded. Right? You want that diversity of perspectives. You want to be challenged. Um, last time I checked, this was an academic institution, an educational environment. And part of being in a rich educational environment is to have your perspectives on the world being challenged and to learn from each other. If I'm only engaged in people who are like-minded, and trust me, there are days when I only want to engage in people who are like-minded because I don't want to be challenged. I just want to play with my friends, and I want people to be of, of similar perspective. But on an on a average day when I want to be intellectually stimulated, I want to engage with people whose perspectives are different from, my, from, from, from mine. So that's your social capital. And that's what Purdue should be about. That's what academic institutions are about. You bring people from different backgrounds and you build your social capital. It's a rich, inv intellectually invigorating environment where people can connect to different people. In terms of your intellectual capital, in the world of funding right, and extramural activities, you want to demonstrate that Purdue is a place where the intellectual capital is high. right? This is a world where we talk about interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, big data, complex this, system this. So you want to demonstrate that Purdue is a place where you can come and you meet people with different, of different, of varied intellects. And that's what your intellectual capital is. And the only way you can do that is if you have a diversity of perspective and over and above an inclusive environment. Right? And I'll talk a little, a little bit more about this linking of diversity and inclusion as a single construct. So that's what you, you kind of look like. Uh, so you have captured and you leverage it as you, you, know, you seek your, to fulfill your mission, and you're increasing your assets, right? You're growing, you're not stagnant, you're expanding. Um, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is the notion of multiple dimensions of diversity. So I'm a sociologist, and I think in some ways we might have done this ourselves a disservice by by labeling our, our efforts as diversity. Because for me, diversity is merely difference, right? So we're not homogeneous. We're, we're never been a homogeneous society. We're, we're heterogeneous. We're different in, in, very, um, in ways. So diversity is merely about difference. But what we have very successfully done is to tether diversity either with women, underrepresented minorities, LGBT. And I'm like, well. You're different from me, and I can probably in enumerate all the ways in which you're different, right? So what we're promoting is um, celebrating differences, capturing differences by being more inclusive. So I, this is not just about getting more women and minorities. It's not about the numbers. It's a little bit more than that. So we've talked about diver the various dimensions. So there's societal diversity, there's a race, gender, that's what we know best, um, physical ability, mental ability. Then, of course, there's value diversity. I'm Jamaican, and I'm all about things Jamaican, right? So my value structure, which guides my life and my, my ever being, is somewhat different, right? And appropriately so from, um, from the, experience, the cultural experience. I just have different values. We may have some shared values and there's some overlap, but you know, we're, we're different. So values, you know, um, 
how we interpret life, how we problem solve, how we view the world, we have different values. And then there's going to be informational diversity. I'm a sociologist. Right? You're a biologist. You're in agriculture. So my informational diversity is going to be different. My sense of what constitutes scholarship and knowledge will be different. My management style, my job experience, all of those things make you different. Of course, there's going to be you know, the interaction, the kind of classroom. So the point is that diversity, race, gender, and societal measures are one element of diversity, just one dimension. But we have somehow managed to be totally fixated on that. So if I look at Purdue, you do have some diversity, you know, men and women. Um, I look at minority students, all students, 13, US only, 17. I took all students, but I'm um, convinced that there's probably some differences if you do undergrad. I think you have undergrad, professional, and grad, but you know, that just gives you a general sense that there is some diversity, right? There's some diversity. Um, in your tenure, among your faculty as well, also by race. So you do have um, numerical diversity. With numerical diversity, people diversity, you bring along as that baggage the multiple dimensions of diversity. So if you have that breakdown, right, then are we suggesting the numbers are probably not right? They're, They're, backwards, on the They're backwards on the top. That's what I'm I thinking. Guess. Yeah. I mentioned that to my staff first. I think they should be flipped, right? right yeah. Wouldn't that be a glorious situation? <laughs> right, but I think that I think that yeah, they're probably of flipped, right? Of course. You know, I'm a girl, so yeah. right. But but the message is that whatever with that you bring the multiple dimensions of diversity. So when you look at the numbers itself, it belies or masks the other elements of diversity that you bring by just looking at your numbers itself. So what do we do in terms of um, capturing diversity inclusion? You're going to take the multiple dimensions of diversity as an institution. You're going to try to capture it through your policies, practices, and programs. We're going to focus exclusively on mentoring for these purposes. And then your business function, um, I think you, this might have been built on Harvard, your education, research, and service, so that, that still holds. So. If you capture the multiple dimensions through mentor, then it will enhance your research, teaching, and service is what we're proposing. All right? So let's talk about strategic mentoring, right? Because this is much about mentoring. So mentoring, I'm going to describe as a strategy and as a mechanism to, to capture the multiple dimensions of diversity. So it's an institution where you're building an environment of support through mentoring that will allow you to be inclusive and capture the talent which lies within. So again, those are your characteristics of your institution, just as a reminder, right? Um, you have these values. Um, MAP describes mentoring as a unique relationship between two individuals. So that's the MAP working definition. It's more than advisement, you're an academic advisor, coach, counselor. They provide their mentees with enhanced academic, professional, and social support. So that kind of encapsulates what the developmental relationship should look like. But I want to talk a little bit more about kind of a broader model of mentoring. So you have one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So mentoring is not a universal phenomenon, right? So you can have one-on-one -on -one mentoring. That's what we probably know best, right? So individualized and personal. It's me and you. Uh, me and my mentor, my mentor diet. You can have team mentoring, which is collaborative and joint. Right? So what happens, you might have a team of mentors. They meet with a mentee together. You may have multiple mentors, which we're recommending. You have, they, they serve different roles. They met from different disciplines, right? so multiple mentors. Peer mentoring, we talk a lot about you know, colleagues mentoring each other. And you can have distance mentoring. So mentoring is not like you know, a, a homogeneous, a single thing. It has many facets or many dimensions to it. And uh, looking again uh, at developmental relationships, mentoring is just one form of a developmental relationship. You have role models, right? people who you admire and look up to. You may never encounter them, but they're people who you like to emulate. You have coaches, 
right, which is one form of mentor, coach of a developmental relationship, deals with performance and are very much on the athletic model, but coaching is something that you should embrace. Then you have mentor, which is a little bit broader in scope and purpose than coaching. It's relational and it's career oriented. What we talk mostly about uh, mentoring relationship, but as I said, there are many forms of developmental relationships. Um, still about mentoring. Um, mentors, they employ coaching as one of their tools, role modeling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so. It's, it, mentoring encompasses some of the other dimensions of developmental relationship, but it's the thing that most institutions are advocating or are designing or have specific programs and policies around. So a sponsor is the one that I want us to look at and figure out in our institutions, how do you develop sponsor relationships, right? Because a sponsor is somebody who advocates for you when you're ready to make the next step. And a sponsor is that person who puts themselves on the line for you, right? And that sponsor is the one who goes, if you mess up, I'm not going to be so happy because I'm calling in the chips, I'm putting my reputation on the line, I'm doing this because I believe you have some value. So when you get to the point in your career where, where somebody is willing to sponsor you, that is a really big deal. Right? They publicly endorse you, they're a strong advocate, and typically they're people who have power. Um, they tell you about opportunities, and they become sponsors when they perceive a special value in you. Okay? So within Purdue, is that something that we should be thinking about? Who, um, which senior faculty administrators are well positioned to sponsor students or other faculty so that their career can be um, can advance. So um, some of the mentoring outcomes, that, because you don't want to develop mentoring um, with this framework without having some sense of what you would like to do, to get, right? So mentoring typically, the relational outcomes, right? The interpersonal relationships that are developed, the motivational, um, dimensions, so career commitment, aspirations, those are all things that emanate and result from mentoring. The career outcomes, which are the ones we're typically most interested in, academic rank, prestige of first job, just you know, general success in your career. The behavioral outcomes in terms of your performance as when you're engaged in mentoring, and of course they're attitudinal. Right, so you're more satisfied, job satisfaction, um, career expectations, and they're health related, right? So you, you get a boost, you get a sense of um, your self-esteem, your self-worth. So these are all things that should emanate from positive mentoring relationships. So as we're talking about diversity, inclusion, developmental relationships, mission, what will it take for us to get there? So we want an institution that embraces diversity inclusion, captures the benefit of the diversity within us, and uses mentoring to do this. Right? So we're trying to, to string these three things together. And we talked a little bit, or I showed you what a transform institution would look like. So when we think about change, right? Academic institutions will have and will outlive most of us, right? So Purdue is how old? 1869, so what, about 170 years, right. 60 years? Right, yeah. So, you know, combined, right? So with that kind of an institution, it's rooted, right? So Purdue has its values, its principles, its philosophies. You know, in all institutions you hear, we've done, always done it that way. You know, that's the way it has been done, you know, 170 years ago, and we're just going to do it for the next 300 years, and, you know, and let's not change. The irony of it all is that institutions should be places of enlightenment, right? So we're, we're, we're teaching our students to become intellectually curious, intellectually expansive, to be change agents, to be innovators, right? That's the purpose of of an education, right, is to open your mind, open your vision. But the place in which we're training them holds firmly to its original values, right, and is less inclined to change. So it's just, you know, it's, there's so many examples of cognitive dissonance where it's like, 
okay, it's good for you, for the student, but it's not so good for us, right? And um, so we don't often emulate or embrace the very thing that we're asking others to do. Uh, so maybe, you know, as administrators, that is one thing that we need to think very seriously about. How do we emulate and role model some of the behaviors that we're asking others to do? But we don't always do that. Yeah? So we're, we're rigid, we're rooted, you know, we hold on to tradition. And I'm not suggesting that we abandon tradition, but, you know, to be flexible and thoughtful about how we proceed. So how do we get there? You know, what will it take? So we can do this incrementally and painfully, right? just kind of step by step at the margins. Or we can do what we call transformational change. So where do we want, what do we want to know and be known for? Just like, you know, just plodding along a little bit at a time, you know, one unit at a time, one person at a time, one department at a time. Or do we, or do we want to do transformational change? which requires a different set of valid proposition, right? So it's going to require some bold statement from the top that says diversity inclusion is valued because we believe it will yield some missions and we're going to implement a set of policies, practices, and programs that move us in that direction. Or we're going to rely on our individual faculty, individual students, individual units to take this on and do this incrementally and then try to convince the rest of the world that this is a good model. So, we, you know, so that's the, what will it take. So this is where we are typically as institutions, um, my Harvard being you know, somewhat similar. So typically, diversity programs are on the side, right? They're stuck out there on the resource, struggling. You know, there's the office of this that relates to diversity, and there's the office of this that relates to URM, and here's the office of that that relates to women, here's the office that relates to LGBT. But typically, it's stuck out there. And if you notice, when we report, we talk about our numbers. We don't talk about the intellectual contribution and the vitality of our institution that comes with having diversity. We're just like we have, you know, 71% men and 27% female and this is a racial breakdown and, you know, blah, 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 and that's it. And, you know, and then you say, well, you know, last year you had 4% and this year it's 3.78 and, you know, another year it was 3 and it's very balanced. But you don't talk about the real benefits and the contribution, what does this mean for my institution in terms of what diversity may bring? All right, so this is the, uh, the traditional model. So what we're suggesting for us is a different, a different paradigm, a shift. And what we're saying is that diversity should be embedded in all of the institution functions. So we're talking about embedding diversity in teaching, research, and service. And that should be the strategy. So you should begin to think about how does diversity enhance teaching, how does it enhance research, how does it enhance service, rather than treating diversity as that very interesting stepchild, you know, that's just out there and Periodically we visit them and we, you know, we say nice things and when accreditation comes up, we throw out the diversity programs and you know, on our website we have the language and the photographs, but it's really sidelined you know, or marginalized, which is very interesting because you marginalize something that is intended to deal with inclusion. So again, this kind of neurotic behavior, right? So you're trying to include and diversify, but your strategy is one of marginalization rather than inclusion. So just those things to think about when we talk about our value proposition as an institution. So again, for Purdue, this is what you say. You say you, you want to enhance human and intellectual diversity among your students. And your metrics are the demography of the staff, and retention, so very much the numeric, right? But you have investment of funds for diversity initiatives, not sure what that means. And you evaluate campus climate. But what is missing is 
what, the, what is the richness, what is the intellectual contribution. So I know what it is that you're doing in terms of some of the outcomes and the outputs, but it's not a full representation of what diversity means at Purdue or what inclusion means at Purdue. So going forward, are there ways in which, as an institution, we can begin to articulate what diversity really means in this kind of setting over and above the numerical um, measures, metrics? So um, how do you know if you're in an institution that really values mentoring? as a strategy for enhancing diversity inclusion. So you should have mobilized institutional resources, right? So if I'm, if I'm developing this environment of support that is going to be inclusive and I'm really paying attention to mentoring and other forms of developmental relationship, you want to make sure that you have administrative support at all levels. You're going to have mentoring expectations in promotion and workload documents that may extend to issues around diversity, inclusion, because nobody, um, we, we, you know, we're a creature of habits. And unless you, you give me a cogent rationale for why I should do things that are over, that apparently or appear to be over and above my expectations or my job description, you're going to have to explain to me why is it that I need to do it. And, you, and ideally, you should provide some incentives and some rewards for why I should do this, right? Because I'm looking at my job description and I'm gonna go the union route. I'm gonna say, this is what my job description says. There is nowhere in it that you tell me about mentoring, nor you tell me about um, diversity inclusion or any of this stuff. So I'm gonna take the union position. You're gonna to have to show me how in my job function, diversity inclusion, mentoring has to be embedded in those tasks. And the way you embed it is if, you're, if your department or your unit says, this is, va this is a value added for our department and all of us are responsible for achieving the goal of that department. So irrespective of what your job is, you are contributing to this valued um, proposition of diversity inclusion. And it's in your task. It's what you do. It's, how, it's, how, it's essentially how we work. Um, you have to do mentor training programs if you're doing mentoring. Um, I want to also say if you're doing diversity inclusion, then you should have some sensitivity and some awareness workshop so that you're kind of all on the same page. You're, you're speaking with a single voice in the, about, about this phenomena. And in, um, if people do mentor, that you want to think about some release time. You know, it might not be much, but it might be just enough to motivate people to do these things. And you should also do some excellence in mentoring awards. So some very visible recognition and awards for doing this kind of work. So one of the, one of the super benefits of diversity inclusion and mentoring is this notion of being a well-networked organization. So if you're inclusive and you're diverse and you know everybody is kind of working together, then you have what we call a well-networked organization, right? And this issue of building a, a well-networked organization through a well-mentored organization is quite important. So I call it a super benefit. And we have heard a lot these days about um, the work that's going on on social networks like everything is about connections, right? And you, you can connect professionally, there's LinkedIn, there's, you know, I don't know what all of them are, but, but they're, they're, they're really ways of bringing people together, right, to network. And the way you bring people together is it's inclusive, right? So people will have how many friends on LinkedIn and how many of this on Facebook, but essentially those are mega networks and they facilitate interaction and engagement that are appropriate for that kind of network. So within, within the academy, why is networking important? And why is it important for underrepresented groups, people who have not traditionally been included, and um, which are usually, at this point in time in our history, are women and underrepresented minority? But I want to fast forward to the reality with the demographic shifts. It's now they're talking about white boys being, um, be, ha, being in jeopardy. Right? So I want to fa fast forward 50 years from now, 
and when that demographic shift, we're taking care of women and URM, it's going to be another group that's going to be on, sea, on the siege. So you want to make sure that you build a culture within Purdue and within all of our academic institution that embraces inclusiveness. So whoever is in jeopardy 50 years from now, we're not going to be negotiating these issues. We're just going to say that is a population that needs the attention and we need to give them attention. At this point in history of the U.S. and the world, the focus is on URM and women. An inclusive society says that that's who requires um, attention. 50 years ago, 50 years forward, that population will be different. So if you set a standard at this point in time that says, I will not embrace diversity inclusion, you're setting a standard that will carry forward 50 years later. This, is a, this institution is 170 years old. You have, you have to set your, your, your standards now for the future. Right. So, that, so that's really important. So in terms of network outcomes, what we know from some of the work we're doing in my office is that women, URM and women fare less well in terms of scholarship productivity and advancement. So when you think of a social network, right, it's um, connection between faculty, and that's what we know best, and how they... Um, Pub publish or how they write for grants or how they collaborate with each other. What we're seeing is that um, women and URM have fewer publications, which is a problem because much of our work is collaborative and team. And as you're looking at um, how academia is trending, where you have multiple authors, and when women and minority are just a part of that, they're less likely to be first or last author. All right, so those, those are some of the things you need to, to think about. They have fewer co-authors, which, which is an issue around um, publications, but the number of um, publications, because co-authors is going to be the, the co-author the co -author of your primary, um, the person who you publish with, they're co-authors. So you can see how if you think of it as a concentric circle, if you're a woman and minority, if your inner circle is small, it has implication for your six degrees of separation. So you don't have anybody to reach out to when you go, you know, first degree centrality, second degree centrality out. You don't, you, you don't have that span. Um, in terms of collaborations, right, and collaborations are important because it has implications for grants, right, and everything. So we as URM and women fear, le fear less well in this kind of network situation. And these are important, and I'm going to use just um, the academy, because these are metrics for promotion and advancement. So if you're not publishing because you're not included and you're not um, collaborating on grants, then you, you just don't do well. So those are some of the things that possibly explain why um, certain groups do not do well in the academy, right? So this probably explains why at Purdue there's 70-something 70 percent men and 21 percent female. And if you look at the ranks, if you're like my institution, you look at the ranks, you're going to see that it's going to be top heavy in terms of male, um, white male mo most likely, and you know, um, URM and women are going to be in the lower ranks. Right, so there's a reason for that, and some of this network stuff may explain it. So what you're also thinking about is the implications for an inclusive environment on um, the, the scholarship productivity and advancement in an institution that says it values the advancement of its, of its faculty and you're capturing its human and intellectual diversity. So if you're not investing appropriately in these individuals that you have hired or recruited, then what does that mean in terms of your institution? So there's some commonalities um, and convergences between diversity inclusion and mentoring. I say they both require an embedded multi-level action agenda. So diversity inclusion has to be included, has to be um, you have to think of it as what's going on at the institutional level, what's going on at the departmental level, what's going on at the individual level. Because you know, sometimes what we hear from an individual level is everything is okay. I don't know why, the, why do we need this? Why do we need to focus on this particular group at this point in time? Everything is okay. 
And my challenge back to them is like, who is it okay for? Is it okay for you as an individual? Like, with which voice do you speak? Are you speaking as an individual for which life is great? Or are you speaking for a department? Or are you speaking on behalf of the institution? So you always have to be clear when somebody says, things are okay, I don't see why we need this. Who is it okay for and what makes it okay? Similarly for mentoring, mentoring is a developmental process. What you're doing by supporting mentoring in your institution is building an environment of support for your faculty, your students, and your staff. So again, it requires that multi-level embedded through everything that you do. You're creating a warm, fuzzy, loving Purdue right? by making an institution where people can thrive and excel. So um, in your mission statement, you talked about you know, um, you're doing stuff for the university, your community, it was the state, the, it was the state, the university, the community, and the world, right? So you really embrace this idea of the collective and the common good. You know, Purdue, you're a land grant, so you really, as an institution, understand that, that common good. So it requires all, all hands on deck, right? So it's all Purdue. It's, every, it's everybody at Purdue to do this, right? It can't be, you know, half of Purdue trying to do this very lofty and ambitious mission. It's all hands on decks, right? Because you're contributing to the common good, right? It requires all hands on deck. This is a big problem, right? So we can't afford to be less than inclusive if you're serious about the common good. And um, I like this notion of envisioning utopia, right? So for me, utopia is an idea world. And I want to I want to challenge you to think what would it mean given that the system interdependences you know we're interdependent and we rely on each other we're all connected what would it what does it mean if we took a more expansive view of the world right where we thought about um, building more broadening expanding because we it seems as if though for all of us we're operating in an environment where where it's more competitive than collaborative, and we're competing for like a small pot, you know, a small pie, rather than thinking about ways in which we may expand that pie. So what I want to think of is, um, what I want to offer for you to think about is, what are the implications of exclusion? So when you exclude groups or individuals, individuals and or groups from, um, let's use mentoring, as a developmental relationship, essentially what you're doing is you're capping their capacity to grow, right? So when they're not in, when they're not in that mix, you have really capped what they can do. You're saying, this is, um, I know you may have some intellectual capacity, I may know you may have all of these things, but um, you're not fulfilled, right? I'm going to cap your capacity. So when you do that, you're on a downward slope, which is kind of where America is, right? America, we're, we're struggling. Right? We're, we're really having a hard time. We're not growing. So I want to offer you this suggestion or just something to think about. If we were truly inclusive and if we were truly expansive and we allowed everybody who entered our institutions to thrive and to grow and to realize their full abilities and, you know, and talents and dreams and aspirations by, ex by equity, by you know, promoting equity and inclusion and all of that nice fuzzy language, what would that mean? Would we, would we get to a new normal? Would we, you know, would we rise to a different normal. And with that normal, would, would it mean that we would, ha we would open up more opportunities? Right? Because individual X will come in and they have, you know, I look at this um, little girl who has adopted me as her grandmother, you know, and she calls me grandma and it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon because I don't have any children. So, uh, but I have this kid who is, con she is my granddaughter, and you know, she's my grandma, and I'm like, you know, I tell her daily how much I love her and how special she is. 
But I look at my five-year-old granddaughter, and I say, and she's just bright-eyed, and she's, you know, so enthusiastic, and she's trying to teach me things, and, you know, and, um, and I say, well, how did, how did we as a society accomplish this phenomenon? I take my bright, beautiful, gorgeous, talented, five-year-old granddaughter, and I send her to school. And X number of years later, she comes out, and she is the least motivated, the most dumbed down, the most unenthusiastic individual. Like, how did we accomplish that as a society, right? So you take this energy that we must be born with, right? It must be, you know, we talk about genetics and biology, but I do believe that we're born with these innate talents and skills. Somewhere along the line, as a society, we've, cried, we've squished them, right? So they're no longer recognizable. So you have this kid at five, and, and then you, know, you, know, you beat them up, through middle, the middle years, and then you say you come to college and you say, but you should be self-directed, self-motivated, and self-this, right? But as a culture, we have not embraced that. We have really kept their capacity. So at every stage of the game, we have found ways to cap individuals' capacity. So I wonder if we became more inclusive Right? allowed individuals to thrive and excel to the best of their ability, would we achieve a new normal as a society? And what would that look like? Right? I just had a question. Go ahead. Um, so what do you mean about uh, capping their capacity, like I guess through middle school, high school? Like what's an example? So an example is um, capping my capacity. I take a kid. And instead of allowing them to think, you say, sit and be quiet, right? That's not a developmental relationship, sit and be quiet. There, there is discipline and there's order, but that is different from a command that said sit and be quiet because you're essentially not encouraging, you're not, you're not encouraging them to think, you're encouraging them to be compliant and to be compliant to a system which probably doesn't necessarily allow them to exercise their brain, right? And then within the academy, as, a, as an example of capping our capacity, so I've talked to faculty and the faculty will come in and they say, you know, I'm interested in studying um, horticulture, but I'm really interested in studying this aspect of horticulture. And they get there and there's like, well, there's no enthusiasm, you know, among the, in the department or there's no funding or there's nothing to study what they are uniquely interested in. So then they get diverted. So we've all been diverted into different things, you know. Some have been more successful than others, but when you, when you do not support people's passion, Right? then that is problematic, or their aspirations and their dreams. That's what I mean by capping their capacities. Or worse yet, when you say, um, as my high school, must have been high school, my high school teacher said to me, um, you're either going to be an uh, abject failure, and I, I grew up in Jamaica, right? This was an expatriate, and she said, and I was in one of the best high schools in my parish. You're either going to be an abject failure or a monumental success in life. And my position was to you too, right? Um, might have been rude and inappropriate, but it was, you know, to you too. Or when I came to Boston College and the, you know, the faculty um, told me I was taking a, a statistics forecast in class, and the gentleman told me I had a family emergency. And there was like three um, classes, or maybe two classes. And he said to me, you know, you're a graduate student, you've missed my class, and you know, that means that you may fail my course. And I'm thinking, this is gonna be a very interesting phenomenon, because I've never failed anything in my entire life. So I'm not sure what this is gonna look like in terms of failing at my class. So, you know, 
I said to him, I said, very, you know, very politely, I by then had learned, you know, a, a fair amount of restraint and self-discipline, that I had reviewed his syllabus, I had looked at his syllabi relative to what my assessment of my own capacities and capabilities and what I intended to do in this course, and I fully expected to get an A in this class. I said, that is what I'm expecting. And, I'm, and I plan to work towards an A, right? So in those situations, you can go either way, right? If you do not have the fortitude, you accept your professor telling you you're gonna, get a, you're gonna fail this class. And you're just like, what? No, we're not, you know? Or somebody saying to you, these are your options, right? So, you know, in many ways, they're, they're direct, and there are indirect ways in which we thwart people's enthusiasm. And for me, the thwarting of people's enthusiasm and is a way of capping their capacity. Because it can't be that, right, it is, it, is, it is that some small portion of us are superstars. But it can't be that all of us are dead, right? It can't be that, you know, there are 10 superstars and a million duds. It's just not, it's not the norm, right? The bell curve, you know, the bell, what's that, the bell thing, that distribution, will we'll kind of give you some barometer, right? So it cannot be. So my position is that how do we deal with the two-thirds in the middle who are the ones who have innate talents and abilities? And you can, you can see, and I'm saying by being inclusive, by allowing equity to bubble up to the top and to be the norm, rather than, an, and an inequity of a society doesn't kind of get us there. Because we're leaving, what you're essentially saying is that as a society, you're willing to leave whole um, segments of your society to, behind. And unless you're operating from kind of a Marxist perspective and you really believe, which is kind of what we're doing now, that you really believe in the reserve labor pool, all right, then you know, but that's in many ways is what we what we are we're doing. We have this tremendous reserve labor pool that is not working at their capacity, but it doesn't help our economic competitiveness. So how can you be truly economically competitive when you're leaving whole segments of your talent, you know, your talent behind? So for me, um, you know, I talk about envisioning utopia is how can we use mentoring as a viable strategy to promote inclusion, inclusion and inclusiveness in diverse environments. My contact information. All right. That's it. <laughs> well, let's, let's give Dr. Hill a um, appreciation. <laughs> Very engaging um, conversation that, um, or at least thoughts that we uh, create conversation. Who has questions, or who would like to go first? I know you have questions, but who would like to go first? Uh, I really just had that discussion about you know limiting capacity, and it's, you know, I think it's, I would argue it's very ob obvious when you look at a, a three or four or five year old and how creative they can be with uh, Legos, whatever it is they're playing yeah. with, and then when we get them to high school, late middle school, yeah. college, um, we we become some fools and say whatever. We have really limited their. Of their ability or their willingness, but yes. whatever it is, to, to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you think that in our system, is is that damage more severe for certain groups? Uh, or any thoughts on that? Well, well I think um, we had this conversation about um, opportunity structures. Mm -hmm. So opportunity structures are exactly that, right? So it's the opportunity mm -hmm. Situations where it might not support your child's development or your, you know, your person's development, you find some alternative mechanisms to do that because you want to maintain an opportunity structure that allows you to develop. You know, so you have a goal, right? And you have aspirations. So you can't do it here. You got you got to augment it. And. To the extent that not everyone has either the resources or the access, and it becomes an issue of access, right? because it's not always about resources, right? because the federal government will provide some of these access. So if you do not have that, 
then it restricts, it really further dampens the ability. And I know um, that the other thing I feel to mention is that this is about rural communities, right? That's an that's a underserved community in your situation as well. So you also have to think about you know, what does this mean for rural, rural communities who do not have access to certain kinds of resources and what is their opportunity structure. Yeah. I want to open the door to let some air in. I do not do. I do not do that. So I guess I had a question about diversity and inclusion when it comes to faculty, because I feel as though that diversity and inclusion in an institution like Purdue um, begins with the faculty. Um, part of the reason I feel like uh, a lot of so I'm a graduate student and I'm in molecular pharmacology. Mm -hmm. So um, in my particular department, <clears throat> there are no minority faculty members. Um, there are only old white males, and there may be two women, and one is leaving. Mm -hmm. So um, they're down to one. <laughs> so I think that um, the faculty are important for diversity and inclusion. Like, have you seen, like, I'm not sure if you do studies on this, these type of things, but have you seen um, more supported diversity and inclusion when there's, like, an increase of minority faculty at an institution? Well, in... Yes, and I would say yes, because what happens is that you, build, you have different perspectives, right? So you really bring in different perspectives, different values, different ideas, different attitudes, right? So it's, it's kind of a, a funny situation because by nature we're heterogeneous, right? Everything. There are different types of, you know, bottled water, the different flora, fauna, like everything around us is diverse. And, you know, Mother Nature might be telling us something, right? So that, because there's that interdependencies. But what we do as a system is that we tend towards more, more homogeneity. So the thing that um, seems to help other systems thrive, there's biological diversity, right? we do not embrace as human beings in our own system. So if you think of our academic institutions as a system, can we thrive and can we succeed and can we continue with just homogeneity when everything else around us is becoming more heterogeneous? So our population, right, demographically, is becoming more heterogeneous. So maybe at one stage, homogeneity in the academy was fine because it looked more like the external environment. But as the population becomes more heterogeneous, can we survive? Can we interface? We talk about town and gown. Um, is it town and gown? The, the relationship between our academic institutions and our communities. But our academic institutions aren't looking like the external community. So what does that mean? Right? So you're, you're right. That if it's, if it's heterogeneous, you're getting one perspective. And even though within, within that group, there might be, you have different values because they have different background, different training, but some of the cultural things that are essential, you're not getting. So you're getting selected elements of, the, of diversity, but not a full exposure to all the multiple dimensions of diversity. So if you if you have a homogeneous, you, you're getting some diversity, but not the full not the full gamut. Yeah. So this summer um, we're looking to bring about ten to twenty students from HBCUs mm -hmm. here to visit for you. Um, not only the academic programs, but um, expose them to some of the affinity groups, the support groups for women and African Americans. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we especially want to do within our college is to reach out to those faculty members who have an interest in mentoring a student mm -hmm. because um, we know that their interest can be thwarted immediately if they have a, a bad experience with a faculty member. And so yesterday when we were talking, you said a man convinced against his will is a man not convinced at all. And so I wonder if you can give some insight on how we help faculty to come to appreciate mentoring in an organic way rather than um, you know, an email from the dean or a, or you know, convincing conversation. Um, do you know of any any ways or things that have worked that help help the light bulb come on organically rather than having it come from the top and say, "Hey, you need to do this. This is important." So, 
um, most have most faculties most faculty been mentored to what extent have faculty been in mentoring advising relationships well, well in the college of ag there's been an effort over the last couple three years to, to try to make sure that we have uh, a committee structure mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. typically left up to the, the new faculty member mm -hmm. and the department head mm -hmm. to think of who who may be on to that match, committee. Yeah. right right so if you if you have uh, if you have faculty who have been exposed to these kinds of relationships, then those are the best ones. So that's a, it's a faculty who have um, had good mentoring relationships, who have been mentors before. Those are always, I would say, do the low-hanging fruit, right? You know, you don't want to you don't want to start off to demonstrate failure. You want to start off to demonstrate success. So I would seek out the faculty members who believe in mentoring. They may not fully understand everything that is required of them, but they believe in these, these kinds of developmental relationships. So it's the same thing. Do you believe that mentoring is important? Do you believe that diversity inclusion is important, right? And do you believe that mentoring serves a useful function? Is there some value? So always you have to show the value of mentoring, right? So why is it important? to mentor these, these individuals and what will they contribute to Purdue. Right? Because you're trying to increase the numbers of underrepresented minorities in your institution. And your point is, if I can demonstrate, if they can be exposed to a positive relationship while they're here, then that increases their likelihood that they will come back to Purdue. This will help you, this institution to meet its diversity inclusion agenda which is, is in the strategic plan. So, you know, sometimes you bring the strategic plan back because the, the truth of the matter is that the in individuals work within this institution, which they probably value and enjoy and or, you know, have some positive sentiments. So I'd make it about the institution rather than the individual. This is what the institution is trying to accomplish, and we need your help. We need all hands on deck. What are your thoughts in that mentoring relationship for starting to uncap those students that have been capped through this whole process? So um, the, the presentation I did for the graduate student talked about kind of the mentee, the mentee and the mentor role. So one of the um, the first thing was kind of, among the things is to envision. This idea of unlearning, you know, a little bit about unlearning, and how do you envision viable, viable alternatives as you're, you know, as you're going through this process. So part of it is unlearning. You know, in you have to establish a purpose and a goal, right? Ooh. Um, you have to I need some water. Or something. You have to establish a purpose and a goal. Let me sit. Um, you have to establish kind of a purpose and a goal right, from the beginning. Because when you establish the purpose and the goal, then you begin to understand where they're going. So you can't engage a mentor relationship without thinking through what that purpose and goal is. right? So that's a way, too, of beginning to uncap. Uh, because it's almost like you're recalibrating by thinking through where, where you head. So, and that, that's a part of the mentor training process. Okay. Other questions? Right. It's hard to do the compare contrast yes, yes. in my in my head to be able to say, look, here's a much higher, greater, mm -hmm. more um, uh, complex uh, understanding of, of the phenomena, 
so therefore we have a better solution. Is there is there any way that you can help us think through how we how we can show that difference? Right. The part of, part of the issue is as we you know as we try to solve more complex problems. Right? So. It's very organic, right? So there was a time when we weren't trying to solve such complex problems. And there was a time when team science and collaboration wasn't that important. So one of the issues around diversity and inclusion is if you have more perspectives, it does help to solve complex problems. So maybe it was less relevant at the prior time. Uh, because problems were not so complex and were so narrowly focused. But with big data, complexity science, team science, collaboration, interdisciplinary, then it requires a different kind of a perspective on inclusiveness. So it's, it's almost contemporaneous with the shifts in how scholarship has, has evolved over time. So that's why it's hard to compare. Because we really don't have enough data. <laughs> we, don't, we really don't have enough data thanks, that tells us about this new, this new stage and this new phase. Uh, because it's, a, it's, it's relatively new. And we have not collected good data. And we certainly didn't collect enough data on the prior stage mm -hmm. to be able to compare. Well, it seems very. Um descriptive um, and, uh, and, and sharing our anecdotes. It's anecdotes. I had a wonderful experience on this. Stage. Yes, and yes. We, we feel like we got a much yes. better um, yeah. result because we were we were challenging each other, but yet respecting mm -hmm. each other, including each other. But I think I think a part of it is kind of aligning what the the task with what you with the resources that are needed. So if you have a task, you know, I don't know, a complex metabolic pathway task, then you have to figure out what would your team look like, mm -hmm. sure. right? And who can, who can serve different functions on that team? And do you want your team to be um, a diverse team or do you want your team to be a homogeneous team? But it's based on the task you have at hand. So if an institution is trying to capture, um, to fulfill its mission, then you need all hands on deck to do that. It almost seems, uh, as you think of faculty and you go through your doctoral program, you're really trained to be the expert in some area. Yes. And so then you put all these experts on a team, mm -hmm. and they all think their right. approach is right. Uh, because it's, it's so ingrained. Right. That's how they've been trained. The idea is yeah. you've got to give and take, and they've been, Negotiate. They've been trained right. almost yes. Yes. You know, historically. Yeah, yeah. And probably even yet today. But that's how we've been trained. Right. But the world of science is increasingly right. collaborative. So, you know, it's these kind of schisms mm -hmm. at multiple levels. So, the way we're training our students to work um, individually. The way our disciplines are siloed, but we talk about interdisciplinary activities. Right. So everything about the way we have constructed our world is um, creates this kind of dissonance or disconnect, this schism. Right. We want people to work as team, but we're not training them to work as team. We do a dissertation that's a single um, project, but then they have to work, go out and work collaboratively. Right. We talk about interdisciplinary courses of study, but nobody wants to yield to get it, right? So if it's going to be an interdisciplinary degree, I want you to do all my physics course and all my math courses. Uh, so it adds time, you know? And our tenure promotion system and reward system, uh, even though it's changed, it's historically been very much based on what you yes. did. Yes, yes, yes. And you did as a leader, and I mean, not as necessary a number of Precisely, yes. So there's no, yeah, there's no way to appropriate. Yeah. So, you know, um, when you have an institution that has done something for 170 years, right. that's what you get. Right? That you have to, you really have to make a dedicated effort and decisive effort that you're going to address these things. Right. Anybody else? 